Would you please all welcome Eric Anderson. Okay, well, this is super fun. Uh, you know, the day, so when I was uh, a student studying aerospace engineering at the University of Virginia, I can only have imagined uh, the time when I would stand in front of an esteemed audience and talk about the launch of an asteroid mining company uh, backed by uh, some fabulous uh, financiers and entrepreneurs and visionaries and working with some of the greatest people in the world. So it's a real privilege and a dream of mine to be here in front of you talking about this and I hope you'll share this, uh, this spectacular moment with me. I have absolutely no doubt that this, uh, the announcement of this company uh, will be a, a seminal event in the future of, of entrepreneurial space and in moving off the planet. Not necessarily because I think this company will be the most successful. I certainly hope it will be, and we're going to work to do that. But because I'm sure there will be many who follow, and as we have started the market uh, and, and the, uh, the, work, the move towards commercial human space flight, uh, this will now create a new industry that's even bigger by an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude. That is the, the industry of what we need, of resources, of energy, and moving from uh, an industry where that exists on the planet to one word exists in the solar system. So we're, no, we're now going to bring the solar system within our economic sphere of influence. And so I'm going to talk to you about the business side of this for a little while. Uh, we're going to talk about four, uh, four areas. And at first, I'm going I'm to tell you about the value of asteroids. So if we're, if we're standing here up in front of you considering this grand adventure to, to talk about resources from space, why is it and how is it that we came to understand and to believe that the asteroids were a great place to start. And the fact is that asteroids, coming from the very, very early part of the solar system, the very formation of our solar system, have existed for literally billions of years and have some of the most interesting and valuable materials that we will need, not only in the future of, uh, in our future in space, but also for our future on Earth. Okay, and so let's talk about that. So, first of all, uh, asteroids, are, first of all, the main belt of asteroids exists between Mars and Jupiter, and as Tom Jones will tell you, uh, there are literally millions and millions of asteroids in the main belt, but we're not talking about those today. We're talking about the near-Earth asteroids. So these are asteroids that exist in co-orbital locations uh, close to the Earth as they orbit the Sun in a, uh, let me make sure I can click slides here, make, uh, in locations that are easy to reach energetically, from the Earth in locations uh, that are not far and certainly not nearly as far as the asteroid belt. And of the near-Earth asteroids, there are really two types, or at least two main categories of materials that we think are extremely valuable. So the first is water, okay? So water in space, as you will, as you will come to learn, is perhaps the most valuable of the materials that we will use and, and, and find in space. Obviously, it's something that's critical to our life on Earth, and of course it will be critical to our life in space. But what we also need to realize is that water and its constituent elements, hydrogen and oxygen, are the most efficient forms of rocket propellant and rocket oxi and, and oxidizer, fuel and oxidizer. The space shuttle, of course, ran off of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. It is the best rocket fuel out there. And so being able to go to asteroids and mine them for water provides us not only, as I will show you right here, not only with the uh, ability to support life in space, drinking water, you know, food, growing food, uh, protection from radiation in space, but also propellant, fuel, and oxidizer that will allow us to open up deep space, open up deep space for human and robotic exploration, to drastically reduce the cost of space exploration. So we'll come to that in the concluding, in the concluding remarks. The second, uh, the second most valuable materials that we're going to find in space are the precious metals and the materials that are very difficult to find on Earth. We have a joke at Planetary Resources, and that is that, hey, what's the big deal? We've been mining asteroids for centuries. We've been mining them on Earth. That is because the areas on the Earth's surface where we will find platinum group metals, for example, are areas of asteroid impact. They're, they're places where asteroids struck the Earth millions and millions of years ago and there are still tiny remnants of platinum group metals. 
Platinum group metals do not occur in the Earth's crust. By the way, these are some of the most expensive materials known to man. We're talking about $1,500 an ounce. Okay, so it pales, you know, the cost of a pound of platinum is actually far more expensive than the cost to put that pound into space. And there are not a few things, there are only a few things for which that is true. So the, so the, platinum, the platinum group metals uh, are something that will be extremely valuable for the future of humanity. These are, these are materials that are very useful in all sorts of industrial applications. And all those industrial applications in which they are useful have to, have to reserve for the only the most important part of that element, whether it's a catalytic converter or a medical device or some sort of microelectronic, they have to reserve the tiniest amount because it's this so, such an expensive metal. And so as we go into the future and bring back eventually these platinum group metals, we will create abundance and we will be in a position not unlike if you go back and look at the history of aluminum 200 years ago, where aluminum was the most valuable and in fact the most treasured metal because we had so much of it on the earth, but it was inaccessible. We didn't know how to extract it from its oxides. And so once we figured out how to do that, it became abundant. And now if you look out here in Boeing Field, we build airplanes and cars and it's all over the place, aluminum, because it's useful. And the platinum group metals will be no different. So we will, we will, we will bring the ability to access these metals into our economic sphere of influence. And so asteroids are, are very high in both of these kinds of materials, among, among many others. Obviously, you've heard about asteroids and the nickel content and the iron content, and all these things will be useful. But in particular, the water that will fuel an in-space economy, uh, and then the, uh, the, 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 the most rare and precious of the metals, which we will eventually bring back to Earth. So, uh, okay, so let's move on to the second point, which is our plan. So we want to talk about how are we going to do this? What is the plan for asteroid mining? So there are really three parts to the plan for asteroid mining. We have thought and thought and thought and, and, and gathered together the most, uh, the most experienced and intelligent people, uh, at least a, a group of these people in the industry who have, who have done deep space robotics. Our team includes people who have landed spacecraft on Mars. Uh, we, have, we have talked and thought about the most important pieces of technology that will enable us not only to go to the asteroids but to eventually extract resources from them. And so we have a detailed technology roadmap that we, will, that we will use to get there, and we're going to develop these capabilities. And uh, cr uh, Chris Lewicki, who's our chief engineer, will get into the details of some of these capabilities and the kinds of things we're talking about. But overall, we have created a line of spacecraft. So the line of spacecraft is called the ARCID line. And Chris Lewicki will tell you more about that line of spacecraft. But the ARCID line of spacecraft will be used for first prospecting and then extraction. So as we talk about the phases of our business, number one, phase one, is to fully develop our technology base and start with our initial line of spacecraft, which we will be launching within 24 months. Second, did you like that? As a brief, as a brief aside, I love that you did that because we, this company is not about paper studies. This company is not about thinking and dreaming about asteroid mining. This company is about creating a space economy beyond the Earth. It's about building real hardware. It's about doing real things in space to move the needle forward. Not just talking about it. We've done enough of that. There's plenty of talking. We're about doing. And so we want to be held accountable for that. We want to generate interest all around the world and have the public follow us as we really work to do a very hard thing, which is to create robots that go into deep space and learn to to remotely mine asteroids. And so we're going to do that. It's going to be very difficult, but we're about doing it. And there will be times when we fail. There will be times when we have to pick up the pieces and try again. But we are going to do it. We're, going to, we're not going to talk about it. We're just going to do it. And so moving on to the second phase, we have uh, the second phase of our business, which is prospecting. So there, there no mining effort, uh, no extraction effort could be complete, of course, without choosing where you want to go. Now there are, as of this morning, there are 8,931 near-Earth asteroids that we know of. Is that right, Tom? Okay. So we have, we have a population of almost 9,000 near-Earth asteroids, which represents, by the way, my friends, 1%, 1% of the near-Earth asteroids that are larger than 50 meters. So there are almost 500,000, there are between 500,000 and a million asteroids that we expect to find out there over time that are greater than 50 meters and that are 
uh, close to us in terms of the near-Earth capability. That's an extraordinary amount. We only know 1% of them right now. And so our first phase beyond the development of our technology is to prospect. We're going to do it by launching a, a space telescope, a series of space telescopes, which are our ARCID 100 series, which you're going to see. And then we're eventually going to launch swarms of spacecraft using our ARCID 300 series to these targets as we characterize them, as we learn about them. And eventually, into the third phase, which is the extraction phase, we're going to decide, based upon the characteristics that we find out in the prospecting phase, exactly where we're going to go and what we're going to do, and so and which, which, which asteroids we're going to go after in terms of extraction. And so we'll look at things like, what exactly are the materials that we find on them? Okay, Where are they? Where are they located exactly? What's their state vector? What's their spin rate? Uh, okay, What are the markets? By that time, when we're talking a few years out here, after we've had a chance to do the prospecting, where are the missions? Does NASA need gas stations on the way to Mars, or on the way to the asteroids, or on the way back to the moon? What are the markets we're talking about? What are the periodicity of these asteroids? Some of them are in great orbits, but they don't come around often enough, or they're in low energy difference orbits, but they don't come around often enough. So we need to study these things and really understand what are the top targets. And once we have those targets, that's when we're going to go and begin to extract. So let's talk about number three, which is who has made this possible? So I'd love to go into much more detail with you on our plans, but suffice to say that we're, we're at the beginning. We're already beginning to build hardware, but we're still at the very, very beginning of what we're doing here. And I would like to just take a moment to thank and, and talk a little bit about each one of our investors, or at least a partial list of our investors who've made this possible. So we've been very fortunate over the years to get to know some of the, some of the most uh, incredible, uh, passionate, visionary people uh, who have started not only companies but industries and who also share a passion for space. And so one, uh, of course, we have to acknowledge first is uh, one of my very close friends and business partners, Charles Simone. Charles has had the, uh, the pleasure and honor, and we've had the pleasure and honor at Space Adventures of, of launching him into space twice. I am super, super proud and super honored to, to, have, uh, to have come to know Charles. And as you can see from the, uh, from the building in which we sit, uh, Charles really does give back and has a dedication to the future, not only for education, but also for believing in us enough to help us try to create this new industry. And so uh, we also have been fortunate enough to, to include in our company uh, two of the key people at Google. So we have Larry Page from Google, who is just one of the most brilliant people and, and greatest entrepreneurs of our time. Eric Schmidt from Google, who is not only an advocate of space exploration, but also of the deep seas and truly an explorer at heart. We have uh, a number of other individuals. I'm not going to have a chance to go through all of them. Uh, one, of our, one of my really close friends and somebody who's been sort of watching us from the start is Ross Perot Jr. Uh, you probably, many of you obviously know his name and the fact that his father ran for president, but Ross was the first person to fly a helicopter around the world. He flew a helicopter around the world and his helicopter hangs in the Air and Space Museum. He's a huge advocate of space and aviation and very honored to have him involved with our company. In fact, I believe we're going to be able to take a call from Ross here uh, during the Q&A session. So, We'll be able to hear from him a little bit. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Rena Sholsky. It's not a name that you've heard. Rena is an entrepreneur. She's a developer. Uh, she lives in New York City. She was our first investor. She goes way back into the days of Space Studies Institute and following space. And she was our very first investor. And she will always have that recognition. And I'd just like to honor her today for making that first commitment to planetary resources. So I'm very thankful for our investors. Uh, I could tell you stories about all of them. But at the end of the day, when we sat down and talked to them, uh, they said there's really three things that we're, that we're excited about. Number one, Eric, despite the fact that uh, you and Peter are good salesmen, we know there's a lot of risk in what you're doing, okay? You can tell us how great it's going to be, but we know that there's a, there's a significant probability that we may fail, okay? We, because we're trying to do something so audacious, everything could line up great, and, and then there could be an event where we fail. But we believe in it anyway, because we believe that attempting this and moving the needle for space is worth, worth it. So we're into it. We're, we're, we believe in that. Number two, we believe in your team. The engineers that you've attracted, the people who have landed spacecraft on Mars, who have, who have, who have deployed tens of millions of chips out into the world coming from Intel in a real industry, these are the people who can actually make this happen. It's not going to take hundreds of people. It's going to take a few dozen people to do this. So we believe in that team. And number three, of course we're interested in making money. If it's successful, 
We hope to make a lot of money, but we're not interested. We, we understand that's not going to happen overnight, okay? We do understand that the pot of gold at the end of this rainbow, if it is successful, will be big. And so those are kind of the three points that we, that we, were, that we heard from our investors, and we believe those are, those are great points, and we're very thankful for that. And so finally, as I, as I wrap up um, my comments here, and as we conclude, I'd like to just say uh, that I think I've been blown away by the, by the fever pitch, if you will, of the media the last few days. It's been amazing to watch the blogs, the commentary, the speculation out there in the world about what, what are these guys up to? Is this, is this for real? Are you kidding me? It's been amazing. And all, except for maybe 5 or 10% of the comments you see out there of the, of, the, of the reaction that people have is super positive. People, I think, have been very excited about the, even the idea of a possibility of asteroid mining. And the good news is that actually what we're talking about here and the pathway we're putting forward, I think, is even better than people thought. Because if we're able to successfully, to successfully deploy and mine for water, we're going to create a network of propellant depots, of gas stations, that literally open up the roadways to the rest of the solar system. So it's going to drastically reduce the cost of deep space exploration. Second, as you, if you go and study and look at the, at the estimates of, of resources and elements and their, uh, their, their, their peak rates and how much reserves we have as a, as a, as a world, you might be shocked to find out some of the, of, of the very common and needed elements that are, going, that are getting pretty low here over the next couple decades. And so we hope to create through these asteroids, through the development of, of space resources, a future where we can count on having space resources enable our abundance and our future generations of prosperity right here on Earth. You know, we see the future of Earth as a, as a, as a Garden of Eden, as a place where we take care of the Earth and we protect the environment and we do our heavy industries and our mining and all that sort of stuff in space. These asteroids, as Tom will tell you, have lifetimes of 30 million years. They're not out there forever. They come and go. It's a very interesting cycle and we need to grab them, quite frankly, before they, before they do some damage to us. And we can use those asteroids to grow our prosperity for the future. And so as I'm wrapping up here, I'm really excited for you to listen to my, to my colleague, Chris Lewicki. Uh, Chris has been a friend for 20 years. Chris and I have known each other since the early days of space, uh, of the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, SEDS. And uh, I was the, running the University of Virginia chapter, and Chris was the national head. And we sort of went in different directions, and Chris took the path of very quickly ascending to the very top of the robotic space exploration programs at NASA, at the Jet Propulsion Lab, 